Hi everyone, I'm Pauline Thornhill. Thanks for joining us. This week on Land and Sea, we take you to Burgio on the island's southwest coast, a 200-year-old fishing town that's a fishing town no more. The winters are left mainly to the women in Burgio. Most of the men have packed up and left. It's how Burgio survives in a new world without fish. Producer Fred Greening has our story this week. It's called My Burgio Home. Burgio was obviously never meant for farming. Most of its homes are tucked away in a landscape of rocks and steep hills. And like most coastal communities, the fishery has been the reason for Burgio's past, but what will be the reason for its future? This 200-year-old town has changed dramatically since the bottom fell out of the fishery 14 years ago. And as if Burgio needs it, its idle fish plant is a constant reminder of what happens to a fishing town when there's no fish. Nearly 3,000 people lived in Burgio in its heyday. Today, that's cut in half. During the winter months, it gets worse. Over 200 men leave town for nearly four months' work in Alberta. Yvonne Dernford is one of the wives left behind. Or you can leave with your family and go away, or you can leave for a short period of time and come home and be with your family. And that's the route most people are taking. With most of their men gone, winters are left mainly to the women. And women with children double up as the second parent. Darlene Peddle. You know by the end of December, first week in January, that all the men are going to be packing up and heading out to Calgary. And it's just a fact of life for all the women here. We all pull together. We all look after each other's children, look out for each other's children for sure, and we do whatever we can for each other. But it's just a lifestyle that either you accept it or you don't. It's not an easy lifestyle by no means, and it doesn't get any easier every time they go. This has been six years, Paul's been going somewhere, and I don't find it any easier being two parents, but that's the way it goes. Okay, that's important too. Uh, Burgio Academy has 165 students, another sign the town is shrinking. 20 years ago, there were close to 800. Hard to find a child who doesn't have a family member who's left town. This guy's father is in Alberta, and his father, and his father. There's always somebody from school that's impacted whether it be father, or brother, or uncle, or somebody. Every person you see is somebody that's gone away. Back in 1970, Joey Smallwood made the future seem so promising. Virgio has only now begun, and there is a good future ahead for this fine Newfoundland outport town. And I wish to God, we had a hundred more Burgios in this province. Back then, Burgio was running at full tilt. A herring fish meal plant had just opened. That on top of a plant already processing eight million pounds of frozen fillets. Jobs were plentiful. Aside from the draggers and the plant workers, there were 150 inshore fishermen. Nearly everyone made a living working with fish. And the man who ran it all, Spencer Lake. How many people do you employ? Uh, I think in total here, well, at this plant here, it's about 300. And over the herring plant, about 50. When I say here in the plant, there's 300, but there are other little things going on. We have a little laundromat up there, dry cleaning and barber shop and all that sort of thing. There was money to be made, and people were anxious to get started. 
Many of the teenagers never even bothered to finish school. Town manager Blaine Marks. There was really no reason for, you know, or some people saw there's no reason to continue on in school beyond grade seven or eight when you became 15 or 16 years old. You could finish school on a Friday afternoon and go to work on Saturday and continue on working because it, the, it looked like there was a, a endless supply of fish and, uh, and you just go to work on the plant and you were going to work there until you retire. Not all the men leave town during the winter. Some hang on till the spring. Murdoch Benite spends his winters at home with his children and grandchildren. And then he and his wife leave in the spring for a fish plant in Nova Scotia. A little town called Shitty Camp, about two hours from Sydney. It's a crab plant. It's about 130 people there, I think. And well, last year, I think, was about uh, maybe 15 from Virgil was working there. They, they pro process all crab. And the season starts usually around the last of April to uh, maybe the first week in August. So you're not gone away from home too long. They're in love with the rugged beauty of this jagged coastline. This is where their homes are and this is where they want to be. And if that means breaking up the family unit for three or four months, it's a price they're prepared to pay. Fort McMurray has a history of attracting people from the east. It's hard to imagine that only a hundred years ago down there, they were trading with the natives for beaver skins. Well, that's the end of, that's the end of the line there anyway, so. An hour south of Fort McMurray, we find our connection to Burgio. It's a scene not unlike a group of Newfoundlanders out checking their rabbit snares, but they're not. These guys are working on the seismic. These guys work with seismic cable, picking it up, laying it out. They walk and they walk. They're walking at least 10 hours a day, seven days a week, three and a half months in the dead of winter. Bruce Foote worked in the Burgio fish plant for 20 years. Well, you got to carry about 60 pounds, I guess, the cables are, and you walk I don't know, I remember last year we walked one day, I believe it was something like 24 kilometers in a day. <laughs> and you work in all kinds of weather? So all kinds, don't stop for nothing. Yep. You lose 20, 25 pounds. Tell like one. At 57, Max Sternford is one of the older fellows around here. He fished for over 40 years, started when he was 16. Max worked on the offshore trawlers. He was the skipper on these boats for 25 years. He was the boss. Quite a contrast to his responsibilities in Alberta. You sooner be here or sooner on the water? Well, I sooner be on the water, <laughs> naturally. What, what do you miss about it? Well, family mostly, but I miss those salt water too, right? Seismic exploration is the first stage in finding more oil. 
seven days a week they're preparing bags of cables and batteries and sensors that are dropped off by helicopter. The guys from Bergio have the job of retrieving this stuff and lugging it through the woods. This is the heart of the operation. Every cable is connected back here. Yeah, Dion, it's uh, 501 on Source 310. This is where they measure the seismic waves from the underground explosions. It's like drawing an underground map. After the dynamite crew is finished, it's time to pick up the equipment and start over. See those red cones? Well, there's an electronic sensor in each one, and there's a magnet on the end of it. The helicopter pilot will hone in on that sensor, the magnet will grab onto the hoist, and it's back to the base. Paul Armstrong is supervisor, another transplanted Newfoundlander originally from Badger. Because the busy time of year for us is after Christmas, January, February, and March. And the labor force out here, we have a hard time finding people that will only work for those three months and then look for something else, whereas the Newfoundlanders, it's just what they're looking for. Because they want to be back to Newfoundland and they want to come out here and work enough to go back home and enjoy their summers. And we lay guys off every spring and hire them back again after Christmas. So it's, it's a perfect relationship. Calgary is the nerve center for the oil industry in Western Canada, and it's here that companies agonize over where to find all their workers. This one seismic company employs 150 people, 43 from Bergio. President Dave Smitty. Uh, the unfortunate uh, in, uh, high unemployment rates in, in Newfoundland are um, uh, very fortunate for Alberta. It has provided uh, an enormous supply of labor that otherwise wouldn't be available to Alberta. And in times of uh, high activity as we're currently experiencing, Alberta would, would uh, not be able to uh, function at this present level without that uh, labor, labor pool that currently exists in uh, the east. This stuff here is all staying here, right? Yeah, they're putting bags The interesting thing about Bergio is, 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 firstly, I think it's fishing. They, and as a result, they have come with that mechanical and hard work attitude that, that we need and, and, and physical attitude that we need in our business. The individuals that we're looking for have to be tough. They, they have to be able to endure uh, long hours, cold hours. Uh, obviously, they're outdoors uh, in the harshest of winters and have some degree of mechanical ability to um, uh, operate the equipment that we run. It's tough work for a base rate of 10 to $11 an hour. But with all the overtime, they'll clear $1,000 a week. Not a lot for Alberta standards, but it's a lot more than they can get in Burgio. People have got to have some new ideas and get away from the idea that the only thing in the world is fish.
because I don't think it's ever going to be a big fishing village again. Ann Calder is a retired doctor. She began her practice here 50 years ago. The people of Bergio have recognized her dedication and that of her husband. He was also a community doctor. The Calder name is etched in stone in front of the new hospital. Here she is in the mid-1960s, a member of the local town council who went on to become deputy mayor and then mayor. She remembers Burgio as being a much smaller place before Spencer Lake opened his fish plant. And she remembers when the men from Burgio had to leave home back then for temporary jobs in the Great Lakes. Most of the wives here now can talk to their husbands every night on the phone. Uh, in those days, they just disappeared for the summer because we only had mail once a week, and no telephone communication at all. The women just didn't have any communication from their husbands at all. Telegrams were the only thing, and they were pretty expensive. And money wasn't plentiful. <laughs> but now they all talk for hours on end every night. <laughs> it's not the same at all. But it is, in a sense, history repeating itself, but a lot better off. Calder says leaving home for temporary work is part of Bergio's future, and those who want to stay have to think outside the box, like the people who started the local greenhouse. It's a living for only a half dozen people, including Leonard Porter. He's one of the owners. Basically, it's a lot of work and not a lot of pay, but it, uh, it means the difference between us boarding up our houses and moving to Ontario or whatever, or, or staying here. There's a lot of stuff you can do. It just requires imagination and, and a bit of uh, determination, I guess. You know. But this is definitely outside the box for Bergio, isn't it? Yeah, I would say so, yeah. <laughs> definitely, for here. Back in northern Alberta, day has turned into night. In the middle of an Alberta winter, darkness comes early and all the wires and batteries and sensors have yet to be picked up. Still ahead for these guys is an hour's bus ride to get back to the main camp and an end to a 12-hour shift. After all that walking and getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning, there's not much left in the tank when day is done. You work, eat, sleep, get up, work, eat, sleep. It's a, it's a routine, but it's, the days go fast. I mean, you're, it's, it's a full day of work, so it's not, it's not that bad. You know, we're here for what, uh, four months or whatever. It's gonna go, it's gonna go pretty quick. We knew Paul couldn't live here 52 weeks of the year. He knew he had to leave for unemployment for employment reasons, and he could be gone for 12, 14 weeks but at least it'd be on for the rest of the year with the family. I would say it's gonna be a continuation for the rest of my life now, seasonal work. I mean, there's not much else unless something happens back home, which is not likely, I guess. It's true that if people want to live in coastal communities like Bergio, family disruption is the new way of life. And it's true that the number of people drawing unemployment insurance is high, but those statistics don't tell the full story. Virgil, you know, it, it's, it's still prospering. You know, with the people going to, to the seismic thing again, right, out in Calgary, and they're gone maybe three months of the year, and then they, they come back then, they're drawing top on employment, and uh, then, uh, you know, this day and age, there's, there's all new vehicles here, and a lot of the houses now, as you can see, has all been modernized. The disposable income per household is as as great, if not greater, than what it was when the, the plant was in its, as you call it, heyday. Uh, people are going away, they're making bigger money. I would say there's just as much money now coming into Virgil or more, maybe, maybe even more. You know, you get talking to the, somebody probably from the business world, and they'll probably tell you that, that there's more money in Virgil now than there ever was. Some people are very pessimistic and say, oh, it's a dying community, but I don't think it is. I think that people, A, have to get used to the idea again of 
some of the men having to go away part of the year. After all, in, in Alberta, the Albertans don't want seasonal work. It suits the Newfoundlanders fine. I think this community has a future and uh, it's a lovely place to retire to. I can't see this community dying completely at all. It's too nice a place to live. <laughs> Next on land and sea, the experts said it couldn't be done in Newfoundland. They said cranberries would never ripen here, but Walter Calloway is proving them wrong. Meet the farmer who dared to be different and see the fruits of his labor. That's next on land and sea. <laughs> 